Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Podcast Pasta. That's a podcast that's like pasta, not the podcast that's about pasta. As always, I'm your host, Mike, and today I am joined with Hoots. You are a video essayist. You've covered a number of, um, I, I guess I would say your speciality is like in media topics. You've covered Frasier, you covered Harry Potter. I think you've even done kind of a retrospective on the Mummy series. Uh, Hoots, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you. How are you doing, Mike? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Um, so my go-to, my signature starting question is, I know I gave you a very brief introduction, but if you can, for me and my audience, and I guess your audience, if they are listening to this, um, kind of, if you want to kind of expand on that and kind of explain in your own words uh, what you do and what motivates the content that you create. Um, I am, I, you did a pretty good job of summing up my channel. I'm a YouTuber uh, who mostly does media criticism. Uh, I think with um, definitely a, a left-leaning perspective on uh, on media. Um, and uh, I don't know, part of the reason I think I do what I do is because like back in back in the day, like in my early 20s, I probably would have just like written a really long, annoying Facebook post about things that, that about feelings that I had about things. And, and then I think at some point I, I realized that I, I should channel that into something um, a little bit more uh, creative and, and perhaps like, I don't know, concrete. I don't, I don't know if you can call like a, a YouTube video concrete, but like into essentially making art for um, some of the arguments I feel strongly about, um, about just like whatever, whatever topic crosses my mind. Um, so I started becoming a YouTuber. <laughs> right. No. And that, and that, um, that kind of leads into like my next question because, uh, you know, I've talked to a few other video essays, a few other people that, you know, um, also do YouTube, uh, and cover like similar, uh, topics in terms of like doing video essays and stuff. So, and I'm always curious about people's backgrounds and how they got started doing this. So for you, was this something that you were doing, like, let's say, like during school or was it something like after school, I guess, kind of connect like the story for me, if you will. Um, it was I, I wasn't in school at the time. I was I was fully out in the world uh, <laughs> living as a, as a grown adult, a grown woman. Um, and uh, I think most of my channel really started to come together during the pandemic, um, which I think is probably a pretty common story. I, I say during the pandemic as if uh, that's a time that's over. Um, it's not. But I mean, like uh, back back when, at least in the U.S., we kind of still cared about the pandemic and, and we were making a conscious effort to stay indoors. Um, it became a project that took up a great deal of my time because I needed a creative outlet. Um, that's not when my channel began. I kind of um, tinkered with a couple of videos uh, in 2019. Um, I think the earliest video on my channel is um, a video about like separating the art from the artist. Um, so I, I kind of had this idea of like launching a YouTube channel where I could discuss things um, a, a little bit earlier on, but it really didn't come together until I had the free time and I guess like the creative will to uh to do something like that and um my background is as a performer I trained as an actor I've um and I continue to work as a performer um so it felt like kind of like a natural um a natural thing to do um to marry like my performance background with also like um you know the side of me that grew up reading crack.com and like being um especially interested in uh, sometimes these quite niche topics or like um uh, interested in um media criticism like looking at media a certain uh way like with a certain framework um that i you know i borrowed very much from like those early 2010s era cracked.com listicles um like marrying those two sides of my personality um video essays felt like a very natural way of of doing that you know right right now that 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 totally makes sense um i don't want to uh kind of 
dox any information about you. So if you don't feel comfortable talking about this, we could just, you know, skip the topic. But um, before, like, this call, you were telling me that you actually work for Universal, right? Yes, I do. <laughs> um, I won't say, I mean, I think it's probably easy to find out what I do there. I won't say what I do, just just as a matter of privacy, but I, um, I do work uh, in entertainment at uh, Universal. And um, I'm also on, on tour uh, with The Sound of Music right now. Yeah, and God, how has that been for you? Because um, I haven't had a chance to really talk to somebody that um, has done like musical work like that. So um, is this like a new experience for you or have you done something similar in your past? I mean, I've done a, I've done a lot of musicals before. Um, I've I've worked a lot professionally, but this is probably the the biggest tour that I've done. Um, this one's a global tour, so um, I'm I'm on a hiatus at the moment. I'm back at home, um, but I will be um, uh, flying to India soon for one of our engagements there, um, and I'm gonna hit like a bunch of tour stops in China. Um, so like I've I've definitely never done something at this scale before um which is super cool um and it's um you know it's it's a really it's a really beautiful show um and especially prescient um in um the times that we live in um i think it's because like the the primary storyline in the sound of music is about the love story between you know maria and the children um it's easy to forget that like so much of the story is rooted in the rise of fascism and actively resisting fascism and it's um it's kind of like a, a crazy piece to be uh touring professionally right now because it's like god i hope this message is sinking in with people <laughs> right one can only hope um but i i guess i'm always kind of uh like curious because I, admittedly i'm not like the bit like i i appreciate musicals like for what they are and i appreciate people that are like really into them i just don't really have an ear for like music um mm -hmm. but uh you know i just simply due to my work uh, i do talk to people who are more interested in music and i you know i'm also a big fan of like watching you know analysis on like music especially as it pertains to like uh, movies and television um and mm -hmm. from what i could gather like doing these type of musical tours they can be like very kind of um exhausting and that you oftentimes um not like these singers are they're like kind of equivalent to like athletes in their own way with how they have to like train themselves and their, their diets and everything um how has how have you like kind of handled that like physical like strain on yourself to like commit yourself to like these consistent shows that's a great question um especially as it pertains to um you know some of these classic um like golden era of musicals musicals like um the sound of music uh a lot of the sound of music really is like um doing an opera like it's it's not always an easy thing um uh weirdly like some of the um some of the ensemble stuff that i sing is <laughs> some of the most challenging um vocal lines that i have in the show um and uh you you just you have to take care of yourself um you have to go to bed early. You you have to forego, um, you know, getting drinks at the rooftop top bar sometimes. Um, which like I'm normally not like the most well behaved singer in the world. Like I I, um, I think I I rest on my laurels a little bit. Um, and you can't always do that when you're doing eight shows a week and you have to sing like a whole bunch of top C's. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you have to, you have to really kind of live like a nun a little bit. Um, <laughs> it's not a music joke. There's nuns in it. Um, you have to live like a nun a little bit. And, um, we have had like a couple of shows, um, like in Manila, um, which was kind of a rough, um, rough leg of the tour everybody was a little tired there were lots of 
rehearsals because we were rehearsing in um new uh a new child cast um i was new to the production at that point it had been touring before i got there um so we had a whole bunch of like new people to like put in um and a couple of the leads um the mother abbess and the um captain uh reached a point where um they they were tired and they 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 said i'm gonna call it i'm gonna call out of a couple of shows and just rest rather than try to push myself um and like I, I do think a lot of your responsibility as a vocalist specifically um, is knowing when to make that call because it's kind of like this um, mixture when you're when you're specifically a vocalist like it, you are a musician but you are also kind of an athlete um, and because because your your instrument is your body and if your body starts to get the wear and tear of of constantly using it all the time um like any kind of like runner or anything like that the only the only cure is rest and you have to like just let it sit out and in that case you know we've got we've got swings that we send in um uh so we do have like game plans for that we've got understudies and swings and things um but it is um it 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 can be a real, um, a real marathon. Um, I, well, this one's kind of more of a personal question for me. I, I guess I'll start by asking, um, do you use like lozenges, like halls or anything like that for recovery? Or is, do you, do you not care much for that? Uh, it really depends. Um, I, I'll use like lozenges if my, if I've been sick and my throat is scratchy, or I guess if I have some kind of injury where my throat feels scratchy, um, just to soothe and prevent me from coughing. Um, but if you have any kind of like damage to the vocal folds, like lozenges really aren't going to do anything to help your vocal folds. Um, th the only thing that you can do is hydrate and rest. Um, however, like, yeah, if you have like um, any irritation that's actually causing you to cough um, lozenges will help kind of like soothe that irritation a little bit um, in your esophagus and like preventing yourself from coughing is a is a good um, is a good idea right and the only reason why I was asking is because I'm always curious with people that like use you know that are like vocalists or that just do jobs like even like video essays uh, to some degree because you're doing like I imagine like multiple takes for thing I'm, I'm always curious to ask people like what their go-to like lozenges if they use them like because me i'm i'm a ricola guy you know mm, I, I love like, yeah. their uh, ricolas like, are good yeah love them um but i, I always I, ask like people what their go-to is so do you have any like favorites yourself or is it just whatever uh usually anything like honey lemon flavored and i tend to if i can avoid it i will skip um anything with menthol or anything um kind of numbing um because when when i'm sick or something and i'm i'm using lozenges i want to um i want to soothe that that scratchy feeling a little bit but i don't want to numb myself to pain because if i numb myself to pain then i feel like i um I don't know if I'm doing like further damage, you know? So I'd rather like, I'd, I want to be able to feel if something is wrong, wrong. Um, but I, I want to like get rid of that scratchy, itchy feeling that you get. I hate that. <laughs> no, that's, that's a good tip. I never even thought about that. I usually just go for, um, I mean, if I'm sick, I always go for hauls because, you know, it's just what I'm used to. But most of the time, if mm -hmm. I can pick, I pick like Ricola, um, usually after like a podcast episode or something uh just yeah. for the, you know just because I, I like the flavor of it um yeah but to get back on topic <laughs> um so your youtube channel uh i wanted to ask about the video that got me onto your work which i i think i was randomly recommended uh your fraser uh video um, I, I guess I'm kind of curious, like, can you like talk me through how you, uh, I mean, I guess using that one as an example, like how you conceptualized going or, or the process of like creating that episode. Right. Um, the Fraser one is actually, um, kind of a, a unique one, um, in a couple, 
couple of respects on my channel. I, low key, I think it might be, be my favorite video. Um, but it's, uh, it was different because it was, um, first of all, it was a commission, um, a fellow YouTuber, Jose, um, who like his whole channel, um, well, most of his channel is, uh, like retrospectives on TV shows. And he was looking to, um, do some collaborations with, uh, YouTubers where, he would do a retrospective and would have like a YouTuber do a video on the same uh, TV show that he's doing a re retrospective on uh, and release them simultaneously uh, just as, as like a pair of sister videos. So um, he uh, recommended Frasier. He, he was working on one for Frasier. So this was like a, okay, I remember Frasier. I have to go back and watch it now, you know, 25 years later and uh write about it um and i looped in another youtuber um neil from uh from the, the leftist cooks uh who's a very very good friend of mine and for the entire time we have been friends they have made jokes about how um they want to watch fraser with me because um in both the UK and Ireland, Friends and Frasier are syndicated and just run all the time. Like they run like every time you come home in, in the middle of the night after you've like had a night out um, for some reason, Frasier is on. So like uh, Neil had always like made jokes about wanting to watch um, Frasier at like 1 a.m. with me. Um, and I was like, so Neil, I got a commission from Jose to watch and make a video about Frasier. Would you want to maybe do this with me? <laughs> because I know you want to watch Frasier with me. Um, and they were like in right away. Um, and actually, Neil did uh, the vast majority of the work on the Frasier video, which might be why it's my favorite on my channel, just because like I uh, didn't I didn't spend as much time with it as I spend with some of my others. Like, uh, this, okay. Tangent as a YouTuber, you do go through this like period, um, this process while you're, while you're working on a video essay where you start to write it and you're like, I think this might be pretty good. And you get like to the end of the writing process and you're like, I don't fucking know. You film it. And nobody likes filming. Everybody hates filming. Um, I even hate filming and like, I'm a performer and my background is in performing. You would think that this is the part that I love the most. Hate it. Then you start to edit it. And once again, like when you when you're editing, you're like, all right, this is this might be okay. This is all right. You get towards the end of the editing process and you're like, this is trash. It doesn't make sense. I feel really depressed. <laughs> and you release it and like I think the first few days after you release it are like kind of like a, a bummer. And then um, you kind of like let it go out into the world and it lives and it's its own. And then you come back to it, you know, months later and you feel okay about it. Um, but I didn't go through that whole like um, grief process with Frasier because uh, Neil edited it. Neil kind of wrote the, um, the framework of the essay. Neil, Neil um, came up with uh like basically the storyline for the essay, like the, the narrative arc of the essay is like, we're trying to come up with a uh, sociological term for Frazier's impact on uh, culture, um, which is simple, easy to like break up into a script, into, into an essay. Um, because, you know, each new paragraph of the essay is um, a new uh, term that we're like pitching to each other as our um, as our characters, Neil and Hoots. Um, and then uh, I would go in and I would write my sections and I would write like I would punch up a couple of their sections that they wrote. Um, and then we literally we, we got together and we had some like um sessions watching Frasier together and we recorded some of those um some of them we didn't record but the ones that we did we kind of included in the episode um and it like um it very much has like um Neil's fingerprints all over it like it it feels like 
it feels like one of my videos, but it feels like a leftist cooks video too. Um, and I think that's what makes it uh, so charming. And then, um, you know, at the end, Neil wrote this like really beautiful monologue um, that they do, that they perform in the, um, um, in the essay about, uh, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm forgetting her name now, but the <laughs> film actress that uh, uh, they uh, make fun of in the very first episode of, of Frasier. And it, it provides just such a lovely, like emotional button um, and thesis for, for the, um, uh, essay. Uh, but yeah, all that is to say, like, this was kind of like an unusual one because it was one of my collaborations with, um, a couple of different YouTubers and it wasn't even initially my idea, but in a way I, I feel like that's one of the reasons it's like one of, if not the, uh, favorite episode that I have on my channel. Um, because I think, uh, you know, collaboration just lends itself so much to the art form of writing a video essay uh other minds other artistic talents um really lead to something um like a like a better product you know right i got you um and you were saying jose uh commissioned you right because i think uh he he's like he has the icon of like a blue jay for his channel right? that's right yeah right yeah that's I have right seen his content I, i'm a huge fan um super nice guy canadian youtuber really great content like 10 out of 10 <laughs> oh yeah i would definitely recommend it um guy he's like bigger huh he's like 200k last time i checked right mm -hmm. yeah and i mean i think that was part of the reason he wanted to like he specifically wanted to collaborate with smaller youtubers and at the time um I don't even think I was 10 K yet. So like, um, I was definitely a, a much smaller fish. I'm still a tiny fish now, but I'm a bigger tiny fish than I was then. Uh, but he specifically wanted to collaborate with like, um, up and coming creators, you know? Right. Well, if you're tiny, I'm microscopic. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's all relative, you know, right, PewDiePie yeah. has got what, like 50 billion. I don't know how many, who has the most YouTube subscribers? Is it Mr. Beast? Oh, yeah, it has to be Mr. Beast. <laughs> Who I'd never even heard of until, like, this year. Yeah, um, I've, you know, I ebb and flow from his whole drama. Um, <laughs> but, uh, what was I going to say? No, I, I really enjoyed the Frasier, um, video myself because it kind of encapsulated, I think, a lot of problems I had with it. Uh, I, I mean, for, mm -hmm. for myself, I don't know if I could go as far as to say I completely hate it, right? Um, yeah. But no, there, there were definitely a lot of issues, especially with how I approached, I think, certain topics. I think the big one for me was um, the, the relationship between Niles and... Um, oh, Mar no. Maris, his wife? No, no. not his wife. Oh, um... Uh, the girl he eventually um, gets with. Yeah, yeah. Why am I forgetting her name now? Is oh my gosh. Or... Like, that's her last name. Um, right. Ah. Oh. I can't oh believe it. Oh my gosh. Why am I forgetting her name? Wait, um, I'm looking it up now. Frasier characters. <laughs> Daphne. Daphne. Daphne Moon. Yeah. Like, and, how they, <laughs> and how they handled that throughout the whole series. I think, uh, I think one time briefly I, I talked about it in like way back when I did like solo content for um the podcast but I guess uh I I guess there's uh, I don't I don't know if you would say that would you say that there is a lot of fans for Frasier or that's kind of dwindled I mean it was it was the Emmy winningest show until Game of Thrones um it ran for 11 seasons and like yeah it's been syndicated everywhere um, I, I, I think it was Neil that made the point, like, um, the reason the Big Bang Theory is so popular, um, and still running is not because it's anyone's favorite show, but because it's like enough people's 37th favorite show, you know? Um, so, I mean, maybe Frasier had some of that going for it. Um, I do think like, um, so in, in the video essay, I came down 
we both came down like much harder on Frasier than I think either of us like really genuinely feels in real life. Like we, we, um, I think both of us are pretty ambivalent to Frasier as a series. I will admit that like it, um, in terms of like, um, uh, like sitcom structure, it's very well written. It's got a very good framework for like, if you want to get into the, the, like if, if anybody listening to this podcast is interested in becoming a sitcom writer, you should watch a few episodes of Frasier, um, specifically the, the pilot actually. Um, I think, you know, comedy ages poorly and, uh, and a lot of, uh, the comedy in Frasier, um, now is so like it, for me, going back and rewatching it, I, I just cringed a lot. Um, it was very like I hate my wife kind of humor, uh, which Cheers before it was even more so. Um, uh, but I think um, I think Frasier was very beloved, and I got a lot of hate in my comments. <laughs> I it, overwhelmingly the response to my video was positive. Uh, like more people liked it than not, but I. Uh, the Fraser stands exist and they were all telling me their feelings in my comment section. Yeah, that was actually going to be my follow-up question was like, were you worried when you initially did the Fraser video that it would draw a lot of ire because, or did you not like think of it at the time and you thought it would be just this fun video to put out and that they would take it, you know, in like stride, I guess, so to speak. I think I was surprised by the amount of ire um, at first. Uh, now, now I think I've like garnered like a good like chunk of of hate watchers on my channel. You know, I've got some I've got some turfs that make sure to watch all of my content all the way to the end every single time and leave a comment. Um, so uh, I love you all. <laughs> if you're listening to this podcast. Thank you. Keep watching. Um, but I, I think at the time, because again, I was I was a little bit smaller then, and most of my community is like um, all all very nice and supportive and sweet. Um, so I, I I think I was like a little taken aback by the sheer amount of hate. Um, even even if it wasn't the majority of the hate, you know, you, you don't pay attention to the good comments. You only pay attention to the bad ones. So I was like a little taken aback. And, and I think I was surprised that so many people uh, still felt so strongly about Frasier. Like there were a lot of comments that from people like my age, I think, who were like, oh, I remember watching Frasier as a kid and I feel really warmly about it. Like this kind of sucks. Like but uh, like not not the video sucks like this feeling sucks like knowing that this show that i um that holds a special place in my heart kind of uh doesn't hold up sucks but and i kind of expected those but i didn't expect the people who were like you know going full on like sjw cringe compilation on on my ass in the comments <laughs> Jeez, it sounds rough i'm terrified of that like i'm still small enough to wear uh <laughs> You know, I'm basically invisible in a lot of ways. So it's just one day it's going to happen, I feel. Yeah, all you have to do is criticize the wrong thing. I mean, it it also doesn't help that, you know, I'm I'm a, I'm a woman on the Internet and I'm, uh, you know, I, I make myself visible. Uh, so you're always going to get a little bit more ire uh, if you're if you're a woman on the Internet. Um, I've, I'm also. uh you know, I, I've been canceled on Twitter once so <laughs> by the right wing. So a bunch of right wingers found my channel and I think a few of them stuck around to sort of hate watch. Um, I, I think the only thing that has kind of gotten me through is a, the fact that like most of the backlash is, you know, not my community. It's, it's right wing people. Um, and B, the fact that I wake up every morning and I'm a hater myself. So I'm like, you know what? Game recognizes game. If you want to come be a hater in my comments, at least you're, you're boosting my algorithm. Well, um, before we continue, we have a word from uh, today's sponsor, uh, Salty Llama. 
Are you tired of lugging around heavy bottles of detergent dealing with the mess of measuring the right amount? Introducing Salty Llama, the ultra-concentrated, hypoallergenic, toxins-free laundry detergent strips that are revolutionizing the industry. Their eco-friendly strips are easy to use. Just toss one in with your laundry and you're good to go. With Salty Llama, you can say goodbye to harsh chemicals and hello to a cleaner, greener laundry experience. But it's not just good for the environment, it's good for you and your family. The hypoallergenic formula is gentle and sensitive skin, making it perfect for babies, kids, and adults with allergies. Don't just take my word for it. Give Salty Llama a try and see the difference for yourself. You'll be amazed at how powerful and effective their detergent strips are. Visit www.saltyllama.com and order yours today. And don't forget to use the code PODCASTPASTA at checkout for a special discount. Again, that's Salty Llama. Thank you so much for sponsoring the show. And uh, back to the interview. Um, so I guess... I, I'm not sure if you've been keeping up with like or how broadly you keep up with, you know, um media news in general, but I, I think I was reading recently that uh at least um I think it was Paramount Plus. Yeah, I think Paramount Plus is uh in talks of doing a revival of Frasier, you know, starring obviously like a lot of the original cast. I don't know if um David Hyde Pierce is coming back. Um so I guess with your retrospective on like uh, Frasier, do you think that the problems that exist in that show, um, do you think they can be corrected in this reboot, or do you think that's just intrinsic with what Frasier is? Um, you know, to to answer that, I I would really and and I I had heard about this potential reboot coming. Um. I would really need to see like what the writer's room is going to be like. Um, because again, like the um, original writers on Frasier uh, were uh, like v- very tight writers. They were, they were good at like making like a tight sitcom. Um, so it's not necessarily that the, um, that the format of the show was fundamentally broken. Um, it was that the, the jokes have aged poorly um so i guess like the the next question is like how would like a a a team of writers maybe headed by the original showrunners um how would a new team of writers uh bring fraser into the the 2020s um how would they um maybe address um (sighs) some of some of the sexism in in the show in a way that isn't um isn't gonna like breach at you or or like bang you over the head with it as well because that would also be like cringe and not funny but like uh, how how would a, a fraser of 2023 uh reckon with his past and i mean like the the series ended with him flying off to join. I think her name was Charlotte, the woman that he maybe probably ended up with. Uh, does it pick up with them living in Chicago? I think it was together. Um, and th- th- what is the content of the show? Like, I I'm not against. I, I mean, I'm a, I guess I'm against the idea of reboots because that's that's kind of all our media diet is nowadays. <laughs> But I'm I'm not necessarily against the idea of rebooting a beloved show, um, pick, picking up where the characters left off, or or picking up with the characters several years later. Um, I just I don't know if it can do. Um, like I I think it either has to be actually good, and like maybe. Uh, a little bit less if it's on a streamer i don't know if that kind of like classic 90s sitcom canned laughter will fly nowadays i think it has to be a little bit more um a realistic kind of like slice of life sitcom like we have nowadays um that will probably seem very dated and old in another 20 years um and i just don't know like i think it would have to be it would have to reckon with its own past a little bit. And again, in a way that doesn't seem preachy. Um, the only other, like the only other show that I'm really comparing it to in my mind is the sex in the city reboot. And just like that. And that is, that is terrible, but like terrible in a way where I would watch 
nine more seasons of it. Like I want it to go on for longer than Sex in the City, but that's because like I've got um, I'm a real sicko and I've got a real appetite for bad things. <laughs> like I um, I don't like I I guess I can kind of see possibly a, a good reboot of Frasier, um, but I just uh, I just I, I don't really have faith in um, that version of it being the version that we would ultimately get if if it does go forward um and then there's also the issue of like i just don't particularly think that kelsey Grammer needs to be working i think you know he had his time he um is a bad person uh and he should go live off of his millions in relative obscurity right all right. No, I yeah, I get, I definitely get what you're saying. Um, the, and the only other like I think sitcom reboot, although I don't know if it's structured the same way. Recently, they did come out with like that that '90s show, which is you know the 20 year time jump from like that '70s okay. show. Right. Which unfortunately I haven't had that time they, to check it out. I haven't seen it either. It looks kind of bad. Uh, they they also came out with um the reboot of Full House and the reboot of Roseanne, neither of which I've. Well, I I don't even think I watched Full House. Like I think it was a little bit before my time. Roseanne was too, but I think I I caught a little bit of syndicated episodes of it when I was really young. Um, but I I haven't caught up with either of the reboots. Right, right. No, I, the Full House is always a funny show to me because it, it's always one of those shows where I think like even if it was like during my time, I still don't think I would have liked it. Yeah, <laughs> um, not my thing. Yeah, definitely not for me. Um, but I think uh, kind of like shifting focus. Um, I think if I'm not mistaken, your biggest video right now is your Harry Potter retrospective, correct? Unless if I'm if unless if I was looking at the uh, your analytics incorrectly is it is it that one yeah no my my harry potter one kind of hit the algorithm a little bit um and so it and i mean i don't mean a pry if you want to like move on from this you can but is that the video that drew a lot of ire from you or was it just you know uh, something else um that i mean that video also got like a fair amount of um of hate uh again mostly from people saying like harry potter is good actually um and like your only problems with it are that it's not woke and that kind of thing uh but for the most part um i that video like just did really well and had a very good like response to it and got shared a lot and referenced a lot um it's not my favorite video on my channel um uh, just because it's like very kind of straightforward, just like talking at the camera. Um, but uh, it's uh, it's sure popular. People sure love to talk about Harry Potter. Yeah, I mean, so many other like video essays, especially with the Hogwarts legacy, I got so, so, so done with it. <laughs> yeah, I think part of the reason it mine did so well is because it was like in the lead up to Hogwarts legacy coming out. And it was like, uh, a month after I got banned from Twitter. So I had like made a video about getting banned from Twitter that like, I pretty much immediately unlisted, but like the video from Twitter got uh, about Twitter got like a whole bunch of new subscribers to the channel. Um, and just like me getting canceled by Elon Musk got like a whole bunch of new subscribers to the channel. And then like the very first thing that I released was like about Harry Potter. So like all these new people to my channel were like, Oh, that's something I recognize and, and watched it. Um, people love to hate on Harry Potter. Understandably. So you actually have uh, some lost media then. In terms of, you know... I do. <laughs> no, um, I have a bunch of unlisted videos. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I apologize because I, I don't think I was following you during that time. I, I only, I think, recently found you. Again, because for some reason, I think I was looking up, like, clips from, like, old sitcoms or something. And it recommended me your Frasier video, but... um, 
and again, this is only if you want to. Can you kind of go over like what actually happened with like uh, you getting booted off of Twitter? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so I I am a, like just full disclosure. I am I am a cis woman. I'm a I'm a cis white straight woman. Like for everybody listening. Um, so I really have very little skin in the game, but a lot of my best friends are trans and i have been very outspoken about trans issues um because i care about whether or not my friends get hate crimed um and i tw like i think this was right after another shooting um i can't even remember which one but i think it was at a at a gay club um and uh the yeah it was at a gay club and the reaction from um tim pool and matt walsh and like the the usual suspects uh following that shooting was basically like um the killings will continue until you all get back in the closet like it was very um it was a very mask off moment there were the any pretense of like thoughts and prayers was like completely dropped um, and and they were just being like openly callous about a bunch of dead queer people on Twitter.com. So one night I got home um, from work pretty late at night and I opened my little Twitter app and I tip tap tapped out my feelings and I wrote God, I'm going to paraphrase my own tweet now. Um, there's screenshots of it everywhere, but something to the effect of like, I think Matt Walsh and Kaya Rychik, who runs libs of TikTok and Tim Pool, um, et cetera, should have to fear for their lives more um, because, you know, they were doing a, uh, a stochastic, a stochastic terrorism. Um, and that by the time I woke up like that had a bunch of retweets um I think I had added to that like th this is this is the part where I do deserve some criticism but I still stand by what I what I said um I added to that initial tweet that I actually think it's uh good that uh, they constantly have to change their phone numbers. I think it's it's good uh, that people like bang pots and pans outside of their houses. Like I I think um, that 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 is uh, the only way to get any to put any pressure on uh, on people like this to stop um, to st stop threatening the lives of of queer people like as a group. Um, so of course, like that got spun into um, I'm pro doxing, which I guess I kind of am um, of of public figures. I think uh, I don't know, uh, and both of those tweets went like sort of viral. Like Matt Walsh discovered it and re quote tweeted it. Tim Pool quote tweeted it. Uh, Kaya Rychik, I think screenshotted it and and was talking about it. Like all the like big right wing accounts were talking about me for a day like i was their main character and they sent all of their minions after me who flooded my dms with death threats which was and rape threats which is honestly like hilarious like i i was not um i did not once feel uh, scared for my life they were like trying to dox me but they were like just posting random addresses in the subtweets uh so i did feel that i was like if that's anybody's real address and they're not b bluffing i'm sorry um <laughs> but um there was one guy who accurately uh guessed my phone number and left like a a very silly voicemail um <laughs> and uh it was it was just all like it was all very funny and very sad um and um while I was recording my podcast, Respect the Dead, with um, Kaylin Conrad and uh, Mandy of Mainly Mandy, um, was when things were going, like, really off the rails. Um, and at some point, somebody with, like, 200,000 followers on Twitter, so, like, not even that many, 
I mean, a lot, but like somebody with 200,000 followers on, on Twitter, um, like snitch tweeted at Elon Musk and was like, is it against your terms and services to threaten people's lives? Which was not what I was doing. Um, and Elon Musk responded, yes. And then nothing happened for a few minutes. And I was, I was still on, like, I, we have all of this audio. Um, <laughs> if anybody would like to listen to it, it's up on the Respect the Dead Patreon page. Um, so, like, M Kaylin, Mandy, and I are, like, kind of going a little bit crazy because um, the eye of Sauron is on me. Like, Elon Musk saw my tweet and is mad about it. Uh, and I was like, fuck it, I'm going to respond. So I wrote, um, hi, boss, with a little salute emoji. And then he immediately banned me. I'm never getting my account back. I've tried so many times. Um, uh, so I, that was around Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, so I very quickly just like wrote a bullet account of like what happened um and then uh went to bed and kaylin and another youtuber um a twitter person uh, marina dove um like kind of punched up my bullet points and i filmed like a very quick video basically a drama video talking about what happened um and kaylin edited it for me and i released it on my channel it was up for a very short amount of time um but it was like kind of like a little yeah, it was a drama video, plus like a little explainer of like, so I'm not on Twitter anymore. Um, and then I I very quickly like um, unlisted that like after, um, I think just a couple of weeks. I didn't leave it up for very long. Wow, I was not, wow, I was not expecting that. <laughs> it was a lot, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like holy crap, like Matt Walsh and everything, Jesus. Yes, yeah, I was okay. I was the main character on right wing Twitter for like about 48 hours. Jeez. Wow. Um, <laughs> no, and that explains so much because uh, when, when I was um, looking to contact you, I, I saw like, oh, she doesn't have um, Twitter or anything. And I thought you were just like a cool kid, you know, like, ah, oh, you know, you don't like social media. And I was like, oh, OK, I could respect that. <laughs> I didn't think I had like this huge backstory. Wow. Yeah, technically, I mean, I did wait a few months and created a new account. It's punished hoots. Um, but it like if at any point Elon spots it, I could get banned again for um ban evasion. And if that I mean if that happens, then I just I won't create another one. Like there's no point. Right. Well, I mean, to my audience, just keep this a secret, right, guys? All right, you know? Yeah, this is just between us. All right, team. Yeah, yeah, we got this. We got this, you know? But Twitter is falling apart anyway. Like, that app is, like, next to unusable now. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, doing a lot of terrible you And, uh, I, I mean, just to level with you for, like, two seconds, um, because I studied, like, you know, uh, you know, UI design and everything, uh, you know, like as a uh, programming thing. Um, and like the staple for all of us was like Twitter, because if you actually talk to, you know, the actual designer, like he goes in and he really went hard on like, yeah, making sure to optimize everything. And it just, it just feels mm -hmm. so weird to like take that away. I mean, not to like, you know, go to bat for Twitter because, you know, whether or not Twitter does good or bad doesn't, you know, matter on my life. I'm just saying. Yeah. Um, it is an evil corporation, but it is very like funny and also frustrating to see it being like run into the ground by a clown. Yeah, exactly. Um, and now uh, this whole like uh, the whole tragic uh, yeah story about um, you know you getting banned for essentially just being a little spicy for defending trans people, um, mm -hmm. which is very yeah. funny because like a lot of. Um, my guests are trans and they've been some like some of the best conversations I've had on this platform. Um, I stand by everything I said. No, exactly. <laughs> especially like my first conversation I had with um, Stylist Substance. I don't know if you've heard of uh, her. Um, mm -mm. But like she's a great like video essayist, I think. Um, I know it's just I gotta it, go find her. Yeah, it's just really 
really sucks. Um, so I guess, I, I guess that does, um, I guess I am kind of curious about that then. Like if you don't really have like a Twitter presence anymore, or it has to be like kind of this like shadow presence that you have on it. Um, how do you normally like communicate with like fans for like new releases and stuff? Do you use like uh, the YouTube community tab or? Sometimes. Um, I, I try not to, um, abuse the the community tab because i feel like um it can wear on people a little bit if you're like f flooding their feed too much um i obviously try to keep my patrons informed on patreon um i have a almost dead discord <laughs> for my channel like a, a every once in a while there's like a little post in it because i'm i'm just bad at using discord so um you know if the captain of the ship is uh is not a very good sailor there's nothing you can do about it um and uh yeah i guess like i don't know i i i i think i lucked out where i got banned right at a time where Twitter stopped being such a helpful tool for getting people to, uh, to go to your YouTube video, but um, maybe that's also just wishful thinking. Uh, I posted a new video about a month after the Harry Potter video, and then I, I haven't posted one in a couple of months. So maybe my next video will, will bomb. We'll find out. <laughs> right. Right. Um, but, um, Actually, like, it's not only, uh, I think this week, at, at least when I, um, on my, like, feed, it says that you're going to have a stream on the 20th, right? Or am I wrong? Oh, that's right. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, this is weird, and this, um, this may not be a very popular decision to make, but, like, back in, um, in the heyday of, uh, of lockdown, when LA was locked down, um, my friend and uh fellow musician daniel alexander and i used to do like these weekly streams because we kind of like formed our own little pod you know i live in a studio apartment by myself and daniel and his girlfriend have a one bedroom apartment so we would just like meet up every week um because daniel and i had an ongoing gig anyway for several years where we um sang for an elderly man so like during the pandemic he and i would just like stream to this elderly man's uh ipad basically and and keep singing with him and for him um and then in addition to that just to like keep ourselves um sane we started doing these like sunday night streams where we'd like make some cocktails and like we'd have a different music theme so like we had like um like jazz night or opera night or like 70s singer songwriter um and uh it got very popular with like you know four or five people that we know um, but that's about it it was just like it was it was like a cute thing so as a as a little maybe ill-advised experiment we're doing one on thursday april 20th um at 6 p.m specific time um and it's just going to be like uh rogers and hammerstein uh classic musicals because i'm currently touring with uh sound of music so it's not going to be like a typical stream you know i pretty much only stream like once or twice a year anyway but it's not going to be a typical stream where like i'm playing a dating game and like talking to people it, it's going to be like a little bit of like a mini concert um, with my friend on his piano and me singing some tunes. Hmm. Yeah, that's that certainly sounds fun. Um, wait, so do you only stream on YouTube or do you also do Twitch? Uh, I used to do Twitch. Um, I kind of let my Twitch languish um, because I, I just never got into Twitch. Right, I gotcha. I gotcha. No, I've, I mean, I've always kind of contemplated. I've always been on the fence, but, you know. I'm yeah. still kind of debating that myself. Um, I worked with kind of a, again, like just before the pandemic in 2020, um, like January to 
to February of 2020, I was a regular on a Twitch, a musical theater Twitch stream called Pixel Playhouse. And I think they're still trucking along. I haven't worked with them like since then, though, because I, I dropped out because because of the worldwide pandemic. <laughs> right, right. I gotcha. Now, um, uh, let me think, what was I going to ask? Oh, uh, you've talked about kind of, I think, your connections a bit with like other... Um, you know, video essays, like how Jose uh, commissioned you to do the Frasier video. Um, mm -hmm. I guess, uh, because I don't know, I, I imagine we would have very different experiences with this. So I'm curious, how has your, how has your interaction been with like the larger video essay community? Would you say it's been like mostly positive or? Yeah. Um, I, uh... I think everybody like finds their own little pockets as well. Like, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not mutuals with contrapoints or anything, not, not texting with her. Um, but I, um, there's like a, a few of us that are kind of in contact professionally. Um, and a few of us, um, who are like genuinely friends outside of, um, outside of being colleagues. And, um, because our career is so strange um, and has, I mean, there, there's so many wonderful things about it, but there's also so many like uh, really off-putting things like, you know, bad comments or, um, you know, um, fans that get a little bit too intense. Um, it uh, Or even just like the unique kind of um uh mental illness that you get when you stare at your own face for tens to hundreds of hours a month editing um it, it it's so like um not just valuable but i think necessary um to form these bonds with like um other video essayists and to be able to like talk about the job um and then outside of you know that kind of um community aspect of it uh it just seems to be a platform that is at its best when people are collaborating when people are promoting each other's work um when when people are building a community because i really think that that's what a lot of the audiences are looking for um especially on the left um because so many of us Especially so many of us USA Indians um, feel so alienated from our communities offline that like it's um, I think it's it's so important for um, even the people watching to feel like there is community online, you know? Right. I gotcha. Now, like for me, for example, because uh, I, I jump from like so many different like talking to people from like so many different communities i'm like kind of a nomad in a sense where like you know i just i just coast along i don't really i i don't like really call myself like a film reviewer because i've talked to yeah i've done plenty of interviews not about film and things like that um but yeah it's yeah. it's it's uh so has it been like so far has it been like fun for you just in general doing like video essay stuff or do you think um has it been just like has its ups and downs? Uh, a little of both. Like it's it's definitely work. Um, I think it's uh, really validating work in a lot of ways. Um, but it's hard. Um, it's especially hard when you've got you know um, other jobs on the side. You know um, because it's it's really a full time job. But I've I've met people from it who really are like among my best friends um and there is uh just uh, as an artist like th there the point of life i think is to put work out into the world um i don't know why i don't know why we're compelled to do this thing um but it is like um it is being compelled um i and and i would i would continue to do it um even if i you know was still at like a hundred 
subscribers. Um, not to sound too much like a, I guess like a, a business nerd or whatever, but um, you know, in terms of like the like the scale of your channel and everything, like where do you, how 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 big do you see yourself like wanting to get with this? Like, do you ever think um because I, I and this is just me assuming, but I imagine like the big goal for like a lot of amateur video essays is to be like a Nebula sponsored like partner like that's when you made it big like you're on that network right i mean i don't know that's just you know arbitrary line that i would set but i i guess i'm curious about your thoughts on that yeah i, I mean i would love to do stuff like nebula um i mean i want to get i want to get big enough that i can afford to live comfortably off of this and i and i don't have to do anything else um you know, maybe take a regional theater production once or twice a year if it's a role that I really want. But other than that, I would like to get to the point where this and Respect the Dead are my full-time job. Um, and I can afford to, you know, not just scrounge together a living in my studio apartment like I'm doing right now with like three or four jobs, but uh, to be able to, you know, afford to... Um, <laughs> live live with some dignity and you know maybe have a family um and whatever that entails if it's like a nebula or if it's just getting sponsored content or if it's uh you know just getting uh really lucky with patreon um patrons like uh whatever it takes so that i can um just focus on this full time um i think that would be my ultimate dream as like a, a content creator. Right. I got you. But I mean, either way, it sounds like you're doing well, even outside of YouTube again, um, being like a, a musician that's like, or, um, not a musician. I'm sorry. Um, I mean like a musician and an actor. <laughs> yeah. Um, a mu actor. No, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, but a musical no, like theater living... performer, entertainer. Yeah, exactly. Like you're 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 living like a lot of people's dreams. Like you know, outside of this, I, I don't want to like disclose too much of my own information, but like I just do like some remote work at home. You know. Yeah, but, absolutely. Uh... And I I don't want to make it sound like I'm like ungrateful for what I have because I really like I'm I'm paying my bills being a performer um it doesn't mean i don't want to grow and um and have bigger things but i am uh i i i am i am living like a lot of people's dreams and i'm, I'm living my own dream and um i think it's okay for our dreams to to get to get bigger once we've achieved them <laughs> right i mean that's like the human condition right to always strive yeah for better. to always want more um well, we are approaching the hour mark, and I don't want to keep you uh, too long here. I, I meant we're a little bit past the hour mark, but whatever. We're having fun. Um, I talk a lot, too. <laughs> no, no, no worries. No worries. It means the less questions I have to ask. <laughs> um, but I guess before I let you go, I guess the last question I would have is, um, I guess for your own audience listening or even some of my you know, my own viewers slash listeners that might be interested in your work. Uh, do you have any big projects on the horizon? Like, can we get like a preview of your future videos or anything like that? Sure. Um, actually, I, I've, I've been, like I said, quite, uh, I, actually, I think I said this off mic. I've been quite uh, burnt out lately. So I've kind of been like, it has been, pulling teeth to like get me to sit down and write um but i am currently working on a video essay that is um probably going to be quite large um and deals um directly with a, another rogers and hammerstein musical not um not the sound of music uh and is about um in broad strokes is about the consumption of problematic media. Um, so I'm going to try to, uh, I'm going to try to deal with that, like field of landmines on my channel. Well, yeah, I mean, we're, um, 
I'm definitely absolutely looking forward to that and anything else that you uh, produce. I, I think I might want to try and check out that live stream if I can. Um, Come along. Put it on in the background while you're making dinner or something. You know, yeah, no pressure a, to engage. <laughs> um, only because I've been, well, I mean, not working hard enough, like, to try and get into musicals, but, you know, it's just, it's always going to be a so-so thing, I think, for me. Um, but I think without... Well, Oh, sorry, go ahead. If you, <laughs> if you tune into this video essay whenever it does come out, you will hear me be very effusive about at least this Rodgers and Hammerstein musical that I'm going to be discussing. So, I don't know, maybe my enthusiasm will wear off a little bit onto you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because um, I noticed that does happen a lot, like, um, with certain video essays, uh, because uh, the person that kind of got me wanting to at least in part look more to like musicality in regards to film is like sideways. I don't know if you've ever uh heard of them. Right, yes, yeah. Um unfortunately I don't think they posted in a long while. Um which sucks because their content is really that good. That happens with big creators. <laughs> Bigger yeah, creators know. always like go through a period where they start to post less. Yeah. I never want to lose that. I, I never want to lose that fire for myself. That's why I'm always kind of worried about like getting larger. It's um, yeah. But um, no. Uh, thank you so much, Hoots, for joining us today. Uh, for anyone listening, uh, new and old, if you want to support the podcast, you can do so in a number of different ways. Uh, I have a Patreon account that I recommend for monthly um, donations. Uh, but if you don't want to commit monthly, I also have a Ko-Fi account for, you know, if you want to just do a one-time donation. I think Ko-Fi also lets you do monthly, but again, I recommend Patreon more for that because you get, like, perks, including um, your name read at the end of the credits here. But since I don't have any Patreon supporters, this section's just blank. Um, I also have merch if you want something more physical that, you know, for supporting the channel. I have, like, t-shirts, um, mugs, what have you. Um, I'm always trying to update it because I've been uh, getting more promo art done. And I always like to do um, merch with the new promo art. So you can always check around for that for maybe if you don't like the latest design, I'll try to like cycle it out with something new. Um, all of this should be linked on my Twitter account. That's at Podcasting Pasta. Again, that's at Podcasting Pasta. All one word. I think the P's are capitalized. I don't think it matters for Twitter. Uh, at the top, it should be a link tree that has all these like listed along with, you know, my anchor link, my YouTube. Um, Hoots, thank you so much for joining us. If you want to shout out, you know, where people can find uh, you and your content. Of course, um, I am on YouTube. I believe it's youtube.com slash little hoot. Hang on, let me just check that. See, I don't even know my own socials. <laughs> Um, uh, also, if you just look up Hoots YouTube, yeah, if you do Little Hoot, it works. Uh, I think Hoots on the web also works, or Hoots. I'll come up. Um, you can find me, uh, at least until I get sussed out, uh, on Twitter at Punished Hoots. Uh, and you can find me on uh, Instagram, I believe, at Hoots on the web. Okay, well, um, rock on, everyone. Uh Thank you once again for joining us. Uh, thank you, Salty Llama, for sponsoring the episode. Again, uh, that's www.saltylama.com. The promo code is podcast, po uh, podcast pasta, all caps. Um, and I will s not see you because I can't physically see my audience, but I will catch you all later. Uh, thank you. <laughs>